So yeah, one of the key findings or key um, takeouts from the from the blog was get to the point. Um, and I guess that's, yeah, the kind of things that raised for me is one thing, you know, look, I honestly think I look at a report and I will go to the start of the report and I will try and find what page the first, after the executive summary, what page is the first finding on? And uh, I can tell you it's often, uh, you know, I want it to be less, I want it to be four or five and it can be tens and it can even be twenties in terms of people using that introduction method, um, evaluation questions, it's a long, long time before people, before you get to the findings. And you can tell people, look, you don't have to read the first 20 pages, but a lot of people aren't gonna take that advice. They're just gonna start at the beginning and stop when they get bored. And uh, so if you don't get to findings early, I think you're gonna have a problem. Uh, I also think that we, you know, there are a lot of things that we feel need to be in reports, um, but my feeling is if they don't, if the if every reader slash most readers don't need to read them, uh, it would be better to put them in an appendix or in a technical report, and that might include context not needed by most readers, and even any results that are not central to. Uh, whatever you are trying to say. All right. So <clears throat> the next point is sort of related is, is report length. And I don't know, we always talk about this, keeping reports short, 20, 30 pages. It's very hard to do, I think, a lot of the time. But it's, uh, um, you know, I think it's, it's a good goal. I, I continue to try and strive towards. Um, it's often a really, really short executive summary and uh, can be useful for people who, you know, need to write a brief on the basis of the report, for example. Um, so you can, that can be like a page or less. Um, and then that doesn't necessarily exclude or rule out a slightly longer summary, um, which can be at the beginning or the end. Um, so the one three twenty five model is often um, mentioned as, as, something people like to use. So it's one uh, one page of um, like very, very short summary. It could be like an, sort of based around infographics or something that's very um, catchy to the eye. And then you have your three pages sort of um, traditional executive summary and then your 25 pages of actual content and then your appendices at the end, which is a way of structuring up a report. And the one thing I like about that one pager is Within government, there it is often the case that somebody is writing a one pager on your report. So uh, it often may as well be you or be people who are involved in in providing that report. Okay. Uh, next, yeah, developing the best structure. So look, um, I guess my feeling on uh, you know the, the blog set out three possibilities. Part of me thinks that uh, I've read many evaluation reports which don't do any of those three things. And so, you know, what we're talking about is who gets gold, silver and bronze in terms of ways to structure the report. Um, this, you know, like Mary, I wouldn't give this one gold. I think I'd probably give it bronze, but, um, uh, but it could work. Uh, one thing I wouldn't do, though, and I have seen it, uh, is listing the evaluation questions and then not answering them because it's so frustrating as a reader to have these good questions which are often quite finely honed and then not be able to put your finger on the answer to that question. Uh, so if you go this way, I would drop the evaluation questions out of the main report. Um, and just sort of following on from the point about evaluation questions and structuring report, and um, I guess this point's really here about the making sure our evaluation questions are evaluative. Um, so if we're going to use them in a, to structure a report, it's important they are evaluative. So by that we mean um, the so what, not what so. So um, sometimes. 
you know, I've, you can come across evaluation questions that are a bit, um, you know, how many did this program um, reach or uh, questions of that nature that aren't necessarily evaluative in, in giving us a, a sense of how, how good was this thing or how beneficial was this or was it worth doing, which is kind of the magic of evaluation. So um, another thing to keep in mind, and there, there's some um, example questions there, often we'll have process outcome and economic questions. Um, it's, it's important to make sure they're evaluative in the true sense of the word. Great. And then if you're using the um, the OACD DAC criteria, I guess my um, my advice would be to answer the questions that are under each of those headings, um, not just to talk around the criteria, because again, it is it can be you know you can have somebody say you know I I can think of examples where you say. What I want to know is whether this program is effective, and they'll say, we'll turn to the effectiveness section, which is pages 54 to 58, and I'll say, I've read them, I still want to know whether the program is effective, I, you know, and that's perhaps why I agree that, um, that evaluation questions, which prompt evaluation answers, uh, is the best way to go. So if you do go this way, there are six good questions there. You know, they might, they might not be perfect, but they're perfectly good questions. Okay. Uh, second point of the article was to report strong findings. Um, hard to disagree with that. The question is, how do you do it? Um, and I guess one thing I would recommend to people is that you road test contentious elements uh, uh, through which could be through a results workshop where you're doing your hypothesis development or testing or through informal meetings. The other thing I would say that this finding prompted for me is the idea that you've got to make sure that you're pushing hard enough. I think, um, you know, people who write reports can be keen to satisfy their client. And I think, um, satisfying them in the first instance could be letting them down, you know, and that you might you might be better off being a bit more courageous and then having some difficult discussions. Uh, and maybe you'll be, you know, I can think of reports where I've been asked to turn it down and I turned it down. Uh, but it was good to have that discussion and to know uh, how far I could go and how, you know, when I really probably did have to stop. The other thing that's important to remember is that you've got a range of important readers and you shouldn't, it's important not to focus only on those readers who, with whom you are in frequent contact, because they are going to be the ones that want the detail and the long, and they are going to be the ones that can read a long report and want to lead a long report. Um, but there are lots of other readers who are making important decisions based on your report uh, who you may not be in frequent contact with. Indeed, you may never meet them, uh, but you still need to be thinking of those users and writing for those users. Uh, so, you know, often the people who are managing a, an evaluation are below director level um, or assistant secretary at the um, at the national government level. Um, so, so do think of those other users, uh, even though they um, you may not know them and you may uh, never know them. Um, so the related point is, uh, is the scope. Um, and then really just trying not to, I think I mentioned this earlier about um, trying to limit how many sub questions you've got. So you're not overwhelmed with a million questions that you need to try and answer. Um, and that's just really around, yeah, making sure your scope's um, appropriate for the size of the project and what data you're collecting. And um, you, people are tempted to throw in more questions and, and um, not necessarily remove them, but it's, yeah, it's really, for a report structure or a reporting, it's 
it makes it your life a lot easier when you have a, a succinct limited number of questions you're trying to answer. Great. And then our last sort of um, reflection from Francis and I on the on the blog and what it has made us think of. Uh, I love this quote um, from Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, if it's a 10 minute speech, it takes me all of two weeks to prepare it. If it is a half hour speech, it takes me a week. If I can talk as long as I want to, it requires no preparation at all. I'm ready now. Um, you know, I just love that idea that, you know, it's hard and it does take a lot of work to make things short and to um, and to work out what the key messages are. Uh, I guess some advice I would offer there is make sure, you know, that there are lots of times, and I have been on both sides of this, uh, where you submit a draft report where it's not really as evaluative as you would like it to be because you're still thinking things through to a certain extent and you're almost asking for feedback in this draft report. Um, if the idea is that there is only going to be one draft report and then a final report, that's not the way to go. You know, you do need to submit a good draft report and uh, I know that where I'm working now, when we contract out uh, evaluation reports, we are asking that the executive summary is in the draft report. It's not, you know, it's not a complete report unless it's got the executive summary because you occasionally do have these situations where people would say, well, we'll do that once we're all agreed on what the content is. But uh, uh, I can understand why people might want to do that, but it's not the right, not the right solution. I guess the only, yeah, the other piece of advice I would give is um, do everything you can not to write a long report, which you then shorten. Um, it's really inefficient. It's sort of, um, it's so hard to reduce, to get rid of words and ideas that you have crafted. Uh, you know, I think you're much better trying to start off uh, writing a very short report and um, and leaving things out and then and then considering whether you add them in. Okay. So that's um, some reflections we had on the basis of the blog that we um, wanted to share with you. Uh, what we're going to do now is is again moving to um, a, a quick little. Uh, groups uh, where we're focusing on two questions. Um, what do you think we could do? What could we do to increase the effectiveness of, of evaluation reporting? And indeed, what could you do? And is there anything else you would add to these to these major points that we've been discussing? There's one that we have wanted to add, uh, but is there anything else you would like to add? So. Um, we'll probably uh, go have a quite short group, probably about five minutes. But I'll set up um, breakout rooms. And our number of participants is, have you got it? Um, uh, sorry, I mean. Yep, that's it. I'm happy with, happy with that. Cool. Uh Um, okay, uh, does anyone want to, um, it's actually, why don't you leave those questions up, Francis, just to, yeah, just to help us. Um, so anyone want to volunteer uh, a summary of some of the interesting stuff from their, their breakout group? James, uh, there you go. Yeah. So I will just say briefly that I think infographics are actually a really great way of just summarizing uh, the report findings. So and you can actually include images and quotes and key results into an infographic. So I think the one three twenty five model is actually pretty appropriate for actually writing up evaluation reports, and it actually reminds us to actually try and develop something fancy to accompany the main uh, evaluation report. Yep, good one. Yep. Yes, cool. Thanks, James. 
I'll pop my yep. hand up. <laughs> yeah, we, we uh, had a big discussion about it's only effective if people read it <laughs> and um, and the thought that maybe uh, only only uh, 80% only read 20% of the report. <laughs> um, and the, the more readability, we talked about diagrams, dot points, good referencing, all those sort of, um, you know, if you like desktoping things are, are critical to, to make it... Um, effective and readable and um, particularly around just making sure that it's easy to follow with structure and all those sorts of things. Yeah, good one. Thanks, Duncan. Yes, yeah, so I can think of a report I read recently where the executive summary didn't mention that the report included recommendations. So when I got to page 75, and it was 75, um, and saw recommendations, I was just, I was amazed, you know, and I thought if I was reading this as an executive, I might have read that whole report and not noticed that there were recommendations unless I'd looked at the table of contents. Yeah. Layla. Um, well, our group had um, like, um, in addition to the um, to the items or the suggestions that was given, our group also added um, video, video, some short videos as part of the reports, like um, engagements with some of the participants, if it's okay to be identifiable. And some parts, some video, short videos as part of the report could be very good, or some other aspects of accessibility, like um, for example, an audio file to go with the report. Mm. Um, yeah, infographics and images were already mentioned. So, yep. Yeah, great. Thank you. Fiona. Thanks, Ben. Um, our group was talking about basically starting with getting, understanding who the audience were so that we got the questions answered appropriately for the different audiences and recognizing that you can have a provider, you can have a funder and you can have government um, agencies, ministers, so multiple levels of people who are interested in the report and who might want to read it, but who might have different um, levels of, of involvement in it. Um, and the other thing that we talked about was getting a situation where people felt comfortable enough to say, to talk about the things that perhaps didn't work so well in order to have things that can be changed and improved for the future. Um, saying everything's going well um, is very nice, but it doesn't it doesn't have any learnings out of it. So um, creating culture where that was possible as part of that process. Yeah, good one. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else want to throw anything in before? Francis and I give you one thing that we would add as in anything else to the main messages from the blog. Can I add something? Yes. Um, so uh, our group just at the end um, heard from uh, one of the participants um, who was talking about, uh, she, she works in uh, Aboriginal controlled organization as an internal evaluator. And she was talking about, you know, different ways of reporting that are not a physical 60 page mm -hmm. report. And actually, if we're talking about the heart of the matter of being use and utilization um, of the findings, the different what we haven't sort of touched on in great depth here, it would be lovely if we could one day is really going into what can you do that's not a report mm. that can get our messages out? Yeah, yeah. Get the messages Agreed. out, but also uh, send it back to the people who participated in the evaluation uh, that that their voice has been heard, yeah. and this is what we heard. How do we yeah. actually do that? Yeah, and do we promise it and then not deliver it? Because I think we occasionally every do. time. Yeah, yeah, of course. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. In terms of getting back to the the end users, that's a great point. Okay, okay. Thank you. There's, so uh, we, I guess, uh, we were very happy to see recommendations in the middle of our word cloud and surprised, but um, but happy, and that uh, because we just wanted to have a bit of a discussion about um, 
about recommendations and how how and whether to do recommendations in reporting. So I guess um, you know what we would add is that it's important to decide early whether a report is going to include uh, recommendations, which are answers to uh, now what questions. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think um, either option is possible, but um, whatever, yeah, and we'll come to this in the next slide, but um, I guess we would advise do not develop recommendations alone. Um, you know, you will struggle on the budget, budgetary and political implications. And even if you get all of that right, you cannot deliver the psychological benefits of jointly determining action. And this is a sort of, I'm not, I'm saying this in part because, uh, because I think it's what works best. And um, moving to the next slide, Francis, um, it's also what a very, my favourite evaluator, my evalu favourite evaluation theorist, at least, um, also argues. And, you know, the idea there is that we know from participatory and empowerment approaches that there's something uh, incredibly powerful about being involved in choosing a course of action uh, and that it gives people ownership of a decision, a personal stake in it and a commitment to see it through. So even if you sort of feel that you know what the recommendations are going to be, if people got together uh, and were given the opportunity to develop them, uh, even if you are right, there are reasons to allow that process to occur, to facilitate that process occurring. So if you are developing recommendations, um, I, we would recommend building in a process to, ve to develop them jointly with client stakeholder input. Uh, and that can either be as the final step to a final report, an action planning type workshop, or alternatively, an action planning process following the final report, uh, in which case it could be done by the evaluators or, or other experts in um, facilitation and action planning. And the last thing we would say, which, have, you know, and it, it does make it more difficult when you do it in workshops, make sure that as evaluators, we are speaking for the data uh, and the findings and that uh, a recommendations action planning workshop is not an idea, is not an opportunity to sort of wipe the slate clean, blue sky, you know, clean piece of butcher's paper and um, start again. You know, it is something where recommendations can only be made as they are linked to findings. Okay, so yes, I'd like to um, thank you all for coming and hope you found the blog interesting and discussing the blog interesting. A couple of other resources that I would recommend to you. Kylie Hutchison has written a short little book called A Short Primer on Innovative Evaluation Reporting and goes into a little bit of detail about the alternatives to a written report. Uh, and I'd also recommend Stephanie Evergreen's website. Uh, and the AES often runs workshops on reporting. And I can say that uh, I think the uh, I haven't been to all of them, but I, all I, what I do know is that the one that Anne Markowitz runs is excellent, and I would recommend that to anyone. Lastly, just wanted to let you know that um, that we meet on a Thursday afternoon. I think it's, uh, it, I think it's the last Thursday of the month, but it's definitely the twenty fourth of August next month, uh, and that is an AES. Simna joint event, uh, which, which is always one of our highlights of the year and brings in a range of different people uh, from, from different organisations and with slightly different mindsets. And that's going to be on place-based evaluation. So thanks all for coming and um, hope to see you on the 24th of August.